today's show, you'll hear investor perspectives on the growing space sector. This is Investor Perspectives. I'm the host of Investor Connect, Hall T. Martin, where we connect startups and investors for funding. Commercial exploration of space continues to advance in technology by SpaceX and other companies. In today's show, you'll hear about a new company in the space sector called EXOS. Our featured guests are John Quinn, Scott Robinson, and Paula Robinson. I hope you enjoy this episode. Scott and Paula, can you give us a little bit of background as to what you guys invest in and what you look for in deals, just to give others context? Well, Paula came across the opportunity through Tradeway. And what we first looked at, we were looking at business growth and potential. Space and rockets are fast-growing industry, even more so now with Blue Origin and SpaceX and all the interest that's going on in the Space Force. So it's, there's even more potential, I think, now than there was when we first invested several years ago. Also, the potential there is with research, particularly with medical applications, stem cells, I'm sure more can go into that later um, if there's questions about that. The education and now even the military with the introduction of the Space Force. Also, we, we looked at personnel. And with Exos, we found there was a perfect combination of people that had extensive rocket backgrounds through Armadillo and all the successes they had there with designing rocket engines for their own spacecraft and through the Rocket Racing League, where people actually flew on vehicles that were powered by rockets made by Armadillo. And then with the business background and the contacts that John Quinn and David Mitchell have, it's just really impressive what Exos has been able to put together. The other thing that, that's really important to us is fiscal responsibility. Exos treats every dollar as if it were their own. And they are very, very conservative when it comes to spending. And what they've done so far is extremely impressive to us. They've done far and away more than what other companies have done with much less. They do a lot of their own tools and parts manufacturing in-house. And then when they come up with needing more money, they only ask for what they need. And they're very specific on on what their needs are and what they're going to do with that money. And that's just very impressive to us as potential investors and now as long-term investors. The other thing that about a company that we look for is their transparency. And Exos is very transparent. Everything they've virtually done has been posted on YouTube for anybody to see, both their successes and even some of the challenges that they've had. It's Everything is just right there. And the communication, John Quinn is always available through email in spite of how, how busy he is. He's always been available through emails and even phone contacts. And they're also very communicative through their website, Facebook. They have an investors page. And that's just very important to us as, as investors, not only when we first started looking at Exos, but even on, as ongoing investors. Great, great. Well, let me switch over to John right quick and give us a quick recap about Exos and what you guys are doing there for those who are not familiar with it. Well, you know, it goes back, if I have to start kind of through the evolution, the space shuttle program, you know, absolutely phenomenal. First demonstration of reusability done by our government. We got 27 flights out of each space shuttle, right? And $1.28 billion per flight. Didn't quite meet its goals, right? I mean, the objective was reusable is less expensive. It gave us a capability we never had. The space station wouldn't be there without it, but it wasn't what we're looking for. So flash forward to 2015 and Blue Origin does their, takes their New Shepard to space and back. And then they launched Blue Origin 2, their second rocket, and it goes to space and back. And then 60 days later, the same vehicle goes to space and back again. Phenomenal evolution. Now we know Elon, or I mean, uh, Jeff Bezos puts a billion dollars a year into that company, right? So with about 3,500 people, he put a rocket in space and brought it back in one piece and turned it around in 60 days. Super impressive. Uh, didn't quite catch up with the space shuttle. We turned that one, the Atlantis, actually in 54 days. So the turnaround got better, right? 
And then come along uh, five years later, and Elon Musk on uh, July 7th of this year flies a flight with a Falcon 9 for $62 million, and he turns it around in 51 days. Okay, team of about 6,500 people, and obviously they're doing other things, but we're moving the right direction because now he can refurbish it based on the online numbers for $15 million and do it in 50 days. So let's now talk about Exos. The rocket behind me is our Sarge vehicle, much smaller, total team of about 20 guys. Now we've flown that rocket four times and you get to see the YouTube video on flight four where we lost the vehicle. But the first four flights, the turnaround from flight one to flight two to flight three, we spent less than 1% of the cost of the vehicle. So 25% is a great thing, but I would still argue we're making remanufactured vehicles, not reusable. 1%? Now, maybe when we go to orbital, we're going to have our challenges. Our target is to be able to do it for 5%. When we go, can go to space with a vehicle, bring it home, and then go back to space with that vehicle for under 5%, we're starting to get to where reusability counts and we can put mass into space very effectively. And that's, that's where Exos is going. Great, great. Well, appreciate the background on that. And it sounds like you have a great team that's been there and done that before. Can you tell us a little bit about the team and what you guys have come from? And you talked about coming from the space shuttle days, but in more detail, what was the team done in the past? So yeah, the team goes back about 20 years. As I already mentioned, Armadillo Aerospace was kind of their founding back in the year 2000, competing in the Google X Prize. <laughs> won a million dollars in a lunar lander challenge, won a couple of rounds. They won first place in the first round. They were beat out by this little company, uh, Lockheed Martin, you might've heard of them, uh, (laughs) in the second round. But they were a team of about 10 guys. And here they are competing up against Lockheed Martin in the lunar lander challenge. So they took second place to them because they were nine inches further away from target after that lunar ascent and descent. So phenomenal background. My favorite story. Rocket Racing League. They contract XYZ company for 36 months to take and put a rocket propulsion system on the back of a canard aircraft. And 32 months in, they say, you know what, guys, we're not going to be able to make it in time to put you in the air for the Tulsa Air Show. They come around to John Carmack, who was running Armadillo Aerospace back then. It was his million dollar a year project. And said, hey, can you guys do it? And this team that's now Exos Aerospace, in 60 days, built up a propulsion system. And they had one little requirement from Len Fox and Dave Morse. Before they got in the aircraft, they wanted to see it start a thousand times, right? Rocket engines are once and done, right? That's the convention. That's what we're used to. So 32,768 pounds of fuel later, they hit a thousand ignitions and those guys got in those aircraft and flew with rocket propulsion in the Tulsa air show, did hundreds of in-air relights of the rocket engines. And again, that's the type of reusability we're looking for. And the coolest statement of all is when Len Fox, now this is a guy who used to launch off of aircraft carriers in an F-14, right? And he said, the kick of that propulsion system of the rocket engine was more aggressive than the kick he got when being thrown off of an aircraft carrier by a catapult. So pretty impressive technology, amazing stuff. But really, again, the reusability. And while we're not looking for human rated on the Sarge and our orbital vehicles, the engines have the reliability to do that. So our guys develop the engines, the recovery systems virtually everything on the vehicle. And so the team is just phenomenal and just a perfect uh, melding of talents. Well, that's great. Appreciate that. And back to Scott and Paula, you talked about why you decided to invest. That was great. And the team, what you liked about it. But why do you think this company will be successful? What are they doing that's going to put them on the other side of, of a winning score there? Well, I think that it's because they just 
no choice but that for them. I mean, they just ooze success and they ooze confidence and they ooze knowledge. When I first met John and heard about this, I went to an actual seminar that they had at the facility. And after hearing what these guys had already done through Armadillo, like Scott and John have already said, and also seeing rocket engines sitting around like doorstops at the facility and then hearing each of them talk about their experience and how they already have had success with Armadilla. I mean, they, it's already happened and we've already had success with Exos. So basically when we invested, my thought was, and I told John this, I'm investing in you. We're investing in you because you have the knowledge, you have the vision, you have the enthusiasm, the creativity, the contacts, the disciplined that these guys are so disciplined and they are very creative. They dream stuff up on napkins at restaurants sometimes Mm -hmm. and, or they used to, they may not be doing that now, but they did, they did a few years. That still happens. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And so it's just the creativity and the vision and the discipline. It's just truly just inspiring is why I think they're going to succeed. They already are succeeding. Also, if I could add a little bit of something, there's a passion there that you very rarely see. The people that are involved in this and do the design and the launches, this is something they were born to do. You can tell. I could tell that talking to them, just the amount of passion and the drive they have. They were just born to do this. And as an investor, I've never felt as appreciated for them because the way that it was expressed to me is that there was a gratitude there that as investors we're allowing and they were, we're providing a way for these people to do what they were born to do. There's just no question in my mind that this is what these people were born to do and they were made for this. Go ahead, John. I said that is so well put. You know, he summed it up in one, one beautiful, eloquent sentence. The guys are doing what they were born to do. Good, good. So... Paul and John, it's always great when things are going well, but what challenges did you see the company overcome that you made, made you think, well, this is the right group? Was there a particular time or incident that brought that to light? Well, COVID, we weren't <laughs> sure when COVID happened how things were going to go because Italy was in the making and, uh, of course, Italy was shut down. And so we were a tiny bit concerned, but Again, they just have so much creativity and there's so much innovation that they find other ways to keep going. And we also were a little concerned when the fourth launch, we were watching that on YouTube live. I mean, we have watched, we went to one launch in March of 2019. And then we, but we have obviously actively watched every single launch and read virtually every article that is out there on Exos or watch videos over and over again. And so when we saw that, you know, that, as you might imagine, that was, that was hard to watch as it was for, for everyone there, I'm sure. But then it's like John, I think it was John that said, well, it's rocket science. You know, it happens. One of them, I think said that, and it was like, we'll overcome it. I mean, it's just inevitable in the field that in this business that you're going to have challenges like that. And that was probably the biggest challenge to date. For for us, it was. But it was, I mean, we've invested again since then because, again, we watched their, I guess resilience is the word. They're just so resilient that they just keep finding new ways to make money. They find new ways to keep things going. They're just not stuck in a rut at all. And I think that's the advantage of a small company, too, is you can be more nimble and flexible to meeting the needs of the market. And I think Exos has done an excellent job of, of doing that. What excites you most about the opportunity? What do you hope to see them accomplish at the final stage? The biggest thing for me, there's a story when the first time I toured Exos, we were talking with some of the engineers and I can't remember the, the person's name, but we were listening to the story and the potential there specifically as it relates to stem cell research where you can take, where there's good evidence where there's good evidence that you can put a person's own stem cells into space and and have it activated. And then when it comes back, that that, those stem cells can potentially be used to do things such as cure diseases and even heal organs. 
And this engineer was telling us about this. And it's it's kind of, it's a world changing thing. And Paula said, oh, wow, if that really comes to fruition, we're all going to make a lot of money. And this big engineer's eyes teared up and he said, no, he said, this will change all of humanity. That's what the potential is. And of course, the money will follow that. Anytime you come up with, with something that that's innovative and that will change the world, as an investor, the money will follow that. But that's what this guy is concerned about, is is coming up with something that will literally change the world or has that potential. And John can probably go, if there's other questions regarding that, I think John could do a better job of filling that in. Yeah, the biomedical world is going to learn how to do microgravity science aboard our SARS rocket. And I have a biomedical vice president friend who was interested in the company early on. And she said, we don't need five flights. We need 50 flights to figure out how to do the science. Put me in space 50 times with 20 or 30 experiments on every flight. And then we'll tell you how long we need the payload to be up there. So the problem that we're going to solve is Sarge as a suborbital vehicle is going to tell us how to do the science. And then Jaguar, our LEO launcher, is going to go to space. It's going to put a payload up there for two to three weeks. And then it's going to bring it back to the launch site. And it's going to be a manufacturing process like no other that we have the capability to do today. Because you can't create the microgravity and the vacuum of space on Earth. You just can't make it manually. So with that capability, we've already flown over 67 experiments that were biomedical research on those first four flights. From the first three, we got phenomenal feedback. And I saw a university go from having 20% cell survival on flight one to a 90% cell survival on flight three because they improved their methods of doing biomedical research. And that was just with three flights. Imagine where it would be with the 50 that this vice president on this very large biomedical firm said we had to be at. Imagine where we could be at 50 flights, which for us is less than a year from now. We could do a couple flights every week. And I think that's what's going to change the world. And that's ultimately very near and dear to us because one of the experiments is what killed one of our founders' mothers. So near and dear to our heart, very much a kind of passion that drives us to to make humankind better through this process and all the while living out our passion to do what we feel we're created to do. Exactly. So so Scott and Paula, are you able to help the team or help the project in some way? If so, how? The launch that we attended to, we did, had some small jobs. I ran a ATV, I guess, and ran tools back and forth between the the launch pad and I guess where their base was. And I think Paula did a few things as well. And then early on, I was involved a little bit in the education portion of Exos. And I believe there are some plans for the near future for me to begin to help with some of the more clerical duties to relieve some of the stress and to give time back to, to John and Phil and Russ. So I think that's in the works. Great. And then a question for you, John, is besides biomedical research, what other applications do you think the vehicle will be used for? You know, we kind of have three legs on our trading table. You know, we picture a three-legged table. You pull any one leg out and the table falls over, right? So we always want to have three legs there. Obviously, the biomedical research or what we call space aid is the name of the program is one leg. And we have space build, which is actual space manufacturing. The board in your PC, right now, let's say it costs $1,000 and it's eight inches by eight inches. If I were to take that to space and heat it up, I could make that board one inch by one inch because the vacuum of space will pull all the imperfections out of it and I can bring it back to Earth. I can stack about 300 of them on our rocket, take it to space and bring them back and basically make grade A wafers out of those grade C or D. And don't quote me on the actual classification of the wafers, but we can make things better in space. Earth is a horrible place to manufacture things. 
It really is. We have contaminants in the air. And we work around all these things that space naturally does. So that would be the second one um, is space manufacturing. And then ultimately, we had to pivot because of COVID. And it moved us a different direction that we always had in the plan, which was to Department of Defense and hypersonic research. Our SARS rocket does Mach 4.1 right now. So to imagine it being a reusable hypersonic test vehicle for sensors and different payloads, is just kind of an easy fit if we just make it a little bit lighter. So we submitted that idea to the U.S. Air Force and Missile Defense Agency. They picked up on it, paid us to do a study, and now we're moving on towards a phase two to see if they want to uh, actually build the vehicle as a prototype and see how that can work. So those are kind of the three primary legs. And all along, we've, from day one, we've had a concept for a national charter enterprise. We believe suborbital vehicles are the way that we train the future space workforce on how to operate liquid-fueled rockets. Because the ones that are going to space and taking heavy payloads up, they're not solids. They're liquid-fueled vehicles. And for a very, very small price, we can fly a flight to do that type of training. Great. And so, Paul and Scott, last question for you is, what else do you think the other investors should know about this deal that we haven't covered already? We covered quite a bit, but are there any final closing comments you'd like to put in? I'd just like to say again that I just think somebody would be hard-pressed to find, we don't have one. We have a whole team that is innovative and creative, and they just like COVID, and they just find other ways to keep going. They adapt, they mold. They're just so, and and the resilience in just not being stuck in a rut and being just so innovative and creative is, is I think they're one of their greatest strengths. In addition to having all the, obviously the prerequisite knowledge to build rockets. I mean, they're so knowledgeable. There, There are a lot of knowledgeable people that do not have just the innovation and the, they just haven't lost their sense of wonder and their sense of, of let's try this. They just keeps coming. We just continue to be blown away by some of the ways in, that they have maintained solvency during COVID and especially with COVID. And I just like to reiterate the four points of business and growth potential transparency, personnel, and fiscal responsibility. Exos just by far checks every one of those boxes. And Paul and I, we will continue to support Exos in every, every way that we can, both financially and in whatever ways that we can be, be utilized. Well, that's great. And, and John, finally to you, what else should the investors know that we haven't covered so far? Paul and Scott are the kind of people that we need to because you know, seeing a, a rocket plant in the ground after the fourth flight to the guys it is part of the job, right? We look at SpaceX and we say, you know what? They lost 14 vehicles in a very short amount of time to get where they were. We got four flights before we lost our first one. And honestly, it was time to kind of say goodbye to R1 because we needed to move on to the next one so we could do some of the creative things that they had come up with that you just need a new build to to, uh, do. So we'll keep innovating. We'll keep leveraging NASA technologies that come out to incorporate it with our vehicle. And we're not going to be the biggest by far. However, I challenge anyone else to be more innovative and creative, keep the company progressing more than our team. They're just, they're always outside the box. Yep. Great. Well, John, Scott, Paula, thank you for sharing your thoughts today. Appreciate the insights into this company and where it's been and where it's going. I want to thank you guys for joining us now. And we'll get this out to the investors who are not here today and tell more of your story and what you have going there. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. As always, be sure to leave a review, subscribe to this podcast, and share it with others. Let's go start up something today.
Malti Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for the basis of investment decisions.